They did. They maximize it. There we go. Hey, Les. Oh, good. I have a little. We got all three kinds of things going on, Sean. Oh, yeah. Gotta love it. I can't hear you. Are we ready or are we waiting on what? what uh, you want, are we ready to roll? Um, almost. They're working on some technical difficulty. We tested it all earlier and it was working. So something happened between then and now. Les, can you hear us? Can you hear now me? Now I can. Now I can. Awesome. And you I mean, this has been. Okay, cool. Yeah, we can hear you, Steph. All right. Coach, you can go ahead and start open it, open it up. Okay. All right. Um, I'm sure the first question is, why the heck are me and Les at our houses and you guys are at the draft house? And, you know, long story short, we had a, uh, a person that got COVID that Les and I were both cl close contact traces with. Wanted to be smart. Um, neither of us is affected by this, but just following the protocols, uh, we wanted to be smart. And uh, hopefully, as long as we remain asymptomatic and our tests come back negative, which that's what's occurred over the last couple of days, we'll be able to have fun. And um, maybe I'll be able to take my shirt off when we draft, like Cliff Kingsbury said. But other than that, hopefully you guys are enjoying that. Sean, just to confirm, you guys have both uh, taken a, a test and it, the test results were negative? Yeah, that's correct. When did that all happen? When did you become aware of it? Did that happened yesterday. More tests to come. <laughs> What is the what is the clearance protocol for you guys to be able to have an in-person event here? Yeah, I think the, the bottom line for us and, and really, you know, it, it was more of uh, let's let's be smart, let's be safe, let's take the next couple of days to ensure that up until and really through Thursday, everybody remains asymptomatic, their tests come back negative. And as long as that's the case, uh, then we'll be able to uh, get it going on Friday and you know, we don't expect much action from us on Thursday unless uh, we maybe trade up into the first round, which, you know, knowing uh, less than the Rams, you never know, huh, Les? <laughs> yeah, I hear there's a few picks for sale. You know? <laughs> maybe they're the Falcon, you know, maybe we move up to four, you know, see what happens. Yeah, that's right. Sorry, just to confirm, you guys, regardless of how you, where you're at in testing and whatnot, won't be here on Thursday. Yeah, that's not the, the plan. Is is Friday will be the first day that I'll be there. When you guys start drafting in the second round, Les, are you able to kind of share what what you guys will be looking for? You know the answer to that, Lindsay. I won't even have less waste this time with that. Come on now. You're better than that. You got to ask the question, Sean. Go ahead, Les. How do I answer this with, uh, to try to be interesting too, but I think like, like we have in the past, you, we try to work and figure out, right, which players at what positions might be in and around, uh, as we've said, swimming in, in that in pool. A little bit harder to do, easier said than done sometimes. So you you, you somewhat got to to wait and, and and see how the draft unfolds and and as it gets closer to 57 at that point in time, you can you can get a feel for what positions may you know there could be a run on certain positions and and you can you know manage the the strategy from there and and whether hey do you go grab somebody do you uh, wait and 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 catch whomever falls or, or, or do you move back and try to uh, grab more capital? But at the end of the day, we've tried to prepare for as many scenarios as possible. Uh, but really you're looking at probably multiple players at multiple positions uh, because there, you know, there's 56 at this point in time, 56 teams get to get a say before we do. Les, when you guys were organizing your draft board, did you, did you see a lot of, uh, in the room about guys who might be available falling to that pick point, or is that a little bit more purgatorial? And might you guys explore trading down? No, we got a new term in the building, thanks to Raheem Morris. 
the magic of Raheem Morris. Uh, obviously, y'all probably interviewed him. So uh, very passionate, uh, vibrant, uh, brings energy every day. But uh, we he definitely termed a, a new term and probably a new grade that we'll implement. It's called the pool party grade. So at that point in time, if there's a, a few players at a few positions, and, and I know he's on the defensive side of the ball, but I know the offensive uh, staff joined in as well. But there's a, there's a few players that, you know, that maybe uh, as we, as Raheem termed it, we'd have a pool party if they fell and uh, we were able to grab them. But uh, to be determined, to be continued, but we'll see. And do you guys, have you guys had exploratory conversations with other teams about the possibility of trading back? And uh, if so, how early did those start for you? Uh, I'll answer. Right now, the uh, answer is we GM start talking this time of year. The answer is a yes on a few. Uh, historically, when you're picking uh, 57 a little late in the second round, uh, at the end of the day, there's a supply demand factor that comes into it. And, but historically, those picks have been traded often because a team that may be uh, sitting in the third round maybe has more capital. Uh, one to move up uh, just to, to, to jump a few teams. So, but I, I do think the exploratory talks will continue between now and then, but uh, uh, again, happen a lot on Friday, but I, I think at that pick, right, there has, there'll be, there'll have to be uh, teams behind us uh, that a player falls to the, you know, to that pick and, and they want to go get it. That's, that's kind of how that, those economics work. Les, with Austin leaving in free agency, is there someone in-house who you guys anticipate taking over at center, or is that perhaps a position you'll still be looking to add to? Uh, I think uh, we've definitely discussed some internal candidates. I'll let Sean, if you want to follow up on that. And, and yeah, definitely, uh, like every draft, right, we, we evaluate the, the center position uh, and, and try try to stack those players uh, as best as possible. But Sean, you might want to elaborate on our discussions uh, from within. Yeah, there's absolutely candidates in our building right now, Lindsay. Uh, you know, Brian Allen's a guy that started at the center position, Coleman Shelton. Uh, and then we've got starting caliber guards or guys that have started at guard that absolutely have the position flex. So one of the things that we've tried to do over the last couple of years is, is really have some position flex, especially with those interior players. Um, but, but definitely have uh, more than enough guys in house. And that's, uh, that's something that we feel really confident about. Your last first round pick was Jared Goff. I was wondering less if you could explain what the first round is like for you and Sean, you haven't had a first round pick since you've been here. What's that like for you? Go ahead, Les. Uh, the, you know, the, it's good question. How do you, how do you answer it? I mean, I think the first round is, is, is obviously a place uh, where there's some talented players. I think uh, based on kind of where we've been at, as a team, where we've been consistently picking since Sean has been here, we've been able to, to win uh, some games, uh, contend for divisions, advance to the playoffs, you're, you're picking later. So uh, even when Sean and I did have a first round pick a couple of years back, we did determine uh, instead of picking at 31, it might be better to move back and, and collect capital. So, uh, you know, right now in this phase, we, we've determined to, to use uh, those picks in a creative way to maybe go get some uh, more known uh, players that can come in and, and help us right now with less uh, projection and development, uh, or we've used uh, that pick to, to add draft capital to, to get, let's call it, instead of just one player, maybe two or three. So uh, it has been a while. It's a, it's a, it's a fun place to pick. Uh, and it's even fun when you're, you, you, let's call it uh, one of our former teammates, Brad Holmes and, and Ray Agnew, it'll be fun watching those guys when you, it's been a long time since we've picked let's call it top 10 and, and you're in, you're in that pool. That's definitely a different swimming pool than we've been swimming in lately. Les, how much has COVID impacted the draft evaluation and how is that going to impact, you know, taking a player and comparing it versus what you, the information you've got, gathered on players in years past? 
You know, it, it's, it, I think this, it has impacted the process. I don't know if, if the, if the process has been, uh, and it's been more and maybe, uh, let's call it when, you, when, when certain, you know, certain data comes across your uh, desk or is made available, right? Instead of having a lot of workout numbers at the combine in the middle of February, we, uh, if you're looking for, you know, the LSU's linebackers numbers, you didn't get them till yesterday, right? So there's been some delay gratification uh, in, in that type of thing. I know Reggie Scott's been a huge with the, the a huge, uh, let's call it organizer logistics idea person in, in getting the, the medical uh, situation uh, where it was a little more consolidated. I know that's been, been probably a logistical nightmare if you say it so, but end of the day, there's been impact, but I'm not sure it's been an impact where, okay, you can't draft, you can't draft successfully. And, and I'm not sure there's really been uh, much of an impact other than when, when information is gathered, collected, and, and when you're able to analyze it. Sean, analyst, um, can you take us through what went into the decision to assign Deshaun Jackson and what do you think he'll bring to the offense? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, first of all, Gary, the history that I, you know, that, that, that I have with Deshaun and, and talking through some of the things that we felt like would help add to our offense, really smart, explosive player. I know he's had some injuries over the last couple of years, but, um, you know, we are confident in his ability. I mean, you even look at the impact that he has. He comes off the broken ankle, has a, you know, an explosive long touchdown where he's just floating past Dallas late in the year. I want to say it was, it was in late December. Um, so he brings an element to our offense where he adds to an already, you know, really solid receiving group with, uh, you know, Robert and Cooper kind of headlining that group, a really ascending player in Van Jefferson. And, you know, with the different amount of personnel groupings that you want to activate, you know, being able to have four and five guys that you feel like can make major contributions from the receiver room is something that we valued. And, you know, he's known for the ability to stretch the top shelf of the defense and, and create and add to some of those explosives, but it certainly isn't exclusive to that. And um, being able to come back home and, and the experience, there was a lot of things that led to it being, uh, you know, something that we were excited about the possibility. And, and fortunately we were able to, you know, get it done and, and real credit to Tony Pastors uh, for being able to figure out a creative way to, to add a player of his caliber. Last, last. Gary. Yeah. <laughs> can you, can, just I uh, wanted to get your, I, I'm sure it's not much different than Sean's, but from your perspective, you know, how did you go about identifying him as a, the guy that could fill that role for you? It, it, Deshaun, correct? Yes. Well, I think you just, uh, two, two ways you can do it. You can, uh, you can go to, you know, uh, uh, what a, our, our, film and, and you can sort by, let's call it big plays and explosive plays and over the last few years and, and, and watch all, the, all of those and go, okay, he, even though he's a, he's an older gentleman, uh, he still roll and you can tap into some of your next gen stats and go, okay, yeah, he's, he's still running with the young guys. So uh, I guess some people are born to run, but it, he's, he's a, a pretty simple uh, eval uh, based on right the the resume that he's put uh, you know on film on ESPN highlights on the grass over the over the years so uh, Jack to have him. Sean, what's it like between you and Les when you're in the draft room together? What's the dynamic like? No, I think one of the things Maria that Les and I have always really had such a good rapport is. I think we see the game through a very similar lens, you know, even going back to when I first got the opportunity to interview for the job, I remember feeling an instant, you know, connection in terms of the things that we valued, what it looked like uh, to operate really in all three phases, offensively, defensively, and in the kicking game. And, and really, you know, I respect the work that he puts in, uh, you know, you can feel the way he's studying it, he loves football. He's passionate about that. And so, I think as with any good relationship, the more that we've worked together, the more I appreciate the rapport and the consistent communication and dialogue. And, and I think as much as anything is, there's a comfort in being able to maybe not necessarily always agree, 
but being able to come to, you know, an agreement that, hey, whatever decision we make, we're making these decisions collectively. And, you know, it really hasn't happened often that we don't see it through the same lens. I can't, I can't think of many times. And that's something that you don't take for granted. And I think it's a real, uh, real credit to, you know, the way that he approaches it. And, you know, I think just the natural rapport that's kind of always been, exi you know, existing between us, you know, where you got good, uh, you know, good feel for one another and, and uh, you know, just good overall chemistry. Last for you, Sam. Yeah, I hope so. Well, it's, it's interesting. Our roles are reversed. It seems like uh, during the season, uh, be a, maybe a calming presence for Sean. And then, uh, you know, I mean, now maybe at the, the, you know, he gives me that look. And <laughs> interestingly, sometimes, uh, again, it's a little similar to maybe calling a game, but uh, Sean can be a very calming presence uh, for myself. Uh, yeah, it, it's been awesome partnering with him and the staff, uh, right? And, and there, there's this chemistry and one of seeing, seeing football for, uh, you know, through similarities of, of the that we're looking for uh, in football players and then working with his staff on, on real skill sets at what specific positions in what role do uh, can help the, the Rams and that's what we're going to try to attack on Friday and Saturday. What what you're seeing from your uh, NFC? Can you all imagine Sean presence? <laughs> Hold on a second. Can can you imagine Sean being a calming presence? <laughs> Very fun. But when you look around at your NFC West rivals, what are you seeing in terms of what they've done so far this offseason? What they could uh, get done in the draft? Either of you, both. Les? Uh, yeah, we were having some technical difficulty, and I was having fun looking, uh, watching Sean facial <laughs> expressions. Uh, can you repeat the question? I know you discussed the NFC West and all the moves that was going on, but to answer it correctly. Right. What are you seeing from your rivals in the NFC West, the moves they've made and what they could do in the draft? Uh, it, I mean, from a big picture, it does seem like, right, uh, we're all uh, probably a, a aware of, of kind of the window we're in. We're all trying to, uh, right, uh, let's call it get an edge on one another. And that being said, we're all uh, being, you know, aggressively uh, aggressive in the way we're trying to get an edge on each other. So I think it, it's, a, it's a competitive league. It's a very competitive division. Uh, and, and each team it, uh, is definitely well coached, uh, have, you know, really good players. And, and we're all trying to maybe uh, stay ahead of each other uh, as best we can. And ag as, a, as aggressively as possible. John, what do you think? Yeah, I think a lot of the same, Kevin. You know, I mean... I think the, the, the main focus is always about, you know, kind of looking at ourselves, but you definitely want to be mindful of those matchups and those things that are going to be really important because the first goal that you have every year is going to be to try to win a division. So I think you closely look at the different things that uh, each of these teams is doing and, and what do we feel like is the best way to present and, and pose matchups that are favorable for us so that, uh, you know, ultimately when you see these teams twice a year, you give yourself a chance to, you know, to be able to create those edges because it's such a small margin for error in this league. But, you know, it's it's a really competitive division. They do an excellent job, you know, all three of those teams. And so, um, you know, for us, our focus and concentration is on building this team the right way, doing a great job with the offseason program that's, um, you know, now in the second week. And, uh, you know, you definitely keep an eye on it, but, but our, our focus and concentration is on ourselves right now. Hey, Sean, uh, as, as you sit with... Hey, uh, hey uh, Lindsay. Lindsay, one second. I wanted to just clarify, too, and then I, I think the teams, what everyone's doing is not necessarily just to beat one another. It's it's to, uh, let's call it, contend in that division and, and, and go on to maybe bigger things. So I know Sean alluded to that, but that's what I was trying to say. The moves being made weren't just the six and zero in the division per se. Hey, 
Hey, Sean, uh, a lot has been discussed about this offensive line class in particular and the depth of it. And I'm wondering as you sat with Kevin Carberry and talked about format and scheme and, and maybe rearranging a couple of guys, what you, you guys landed on in terms of traits that you're specifically looking for in some of these guys for the future. Oh yeah. I mean, that's, is that Jordan that asked that question? Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, you know, Jordan, it's, it's, that's all we've been doing for the last couple months. You know, I mean, I think it all starts with, you know, how do you make sure with what we have, what do we want to be? And then how is that going to, you know, express itself as we get on the grass and, and get a chance to work with these players, but there will be a lot of continuity that we'll be able to keep. I think the best thing that happened to us, that was kind of a blessing in disguise going back to a couple of years ago is the depth that we were able to develop with a lot of different guys being forced to play earlier than maybe we ever anticipated. I think last year we saw the benefits of that. Um, you know, and then I think really going into this coming season, you've got a lot of depth with, with guys you feel really good about that have some position flex. I mean, seen Bobby Evans start at guard at tackle. You've seen David Edwards and Austin Corbett both start at the left and the right guard spots. Um, you've seen Joe Nopum start at the guard spot and the tackle spot. And so that position flex is something that's extremely valuable and beneficial. You know, mm -hmm. and I'll tell you what's been really helpful is Kevin Carberry, the mastery that he's had from recruiting and a lot of the crossover with whether it's Pac-12 guys or even just when you're looking at a lot of these linemen now that are coming out, he's got a great command of this draft class because he was at Stanford for three years. And um, I've really, really enjoyed working with him and the rest of our offensive coaching staff and Les and his group and collaborating and kind of understanding, all right, where are there some possible players depending upon where we decide if we decide to utilize a pick on an offensive lineman that can add depth or provide real value for us. And uh, those are things that we're excited about seeing how this week unfolds, but a lot of good options. And, and that's uh, a huge part of what the last couple months have entailed, Jordan. Les, what was the thought process of signing uh, Hunter, uh, Corey, or Jorquez? And how does that affect Johnny Hecker's status, if at all? Yeah, I think that uh, I will put that under the I call it the Nikhil Roby bucket and every year during free agency, right? And the, and the bell's about to ring, uh, you know, each team gets a waiver wire and, and has all the lists of the unrestricted free agents on it. But there is this subset of list of, of players who weren't tendered uh, by their, their club for reason. And I know uh, Nikhil Roby was one of those players, Rameek Wilson, if you remember him. So I know our, our pro staff, you know, it was, you know, uh, this year John McKay has been leading the charge with the, you know, uh, Ray leaving uh, for bigger and better things and Matt Wall working with him. But I know, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, the punter was one that they recommend uh, as someone that uh, had a very good year, didn't get tendered for whatever reason. So uh, or to, to the Nikel Roby signing to Rameek, Wilson signing, us signing, Doug Hodges this year, claiming Austin Blythe or, or Troy Hill or Darius Williams. It's it's when a player comes available, a uh, chance to add. And I think, you know, obviously uh, Johnny's Johnny's resume speaks for itself. So, and right now I think we got the, the most specialists of probably anybody in the league. We have probably seven, probably got two. Two kickers, two punters, one guy who can kick and pun, and two long snappers. But I know we began that a little bit last year because during COVID, uh, if you did have an outbreak and you did lose some players, uh, they, hey, there's if you lost a corner, there's usually three, four, or five others that uh, you have an answer for. But with the specialists, if you lose uh, in contact tracing, there's really no answer. So it uh, goes under that bucket. Just to clarify on Gary's question, Les, so this is not a punting competition. Is that what you're saying? Or is it a punting competition? No. Well, I think no. anytime you go to the practice field, it's a competition. But yeah, that's it's not. Sorry, you're breaking up. So I thank Sean. I appreciate it. So it's not. It's not. It's not. It's not. It's not. Hey, Sean, uh, talking about some of those position players, um, you guys met with Jennifer Fleet, Lainer. How big of a priority is 
getting a good center in the draft. I, I, I'm sorry, I, Claudia, I, I, I heard the latter part of it. You just said, did you say how big of a priority is getting a center? Yes, in the draft. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I think it's not something that you feel like you have to fill because we've got a lot of guys in house that, that we feel like are more than capable of, of being starting caliber NFL centers. And so, um, you know, if it, uh, if it's something, you know, depending upon how everything falls, uh, it, it might be something that you address, but by no, I think the one thing that's been really good and Les and I've talked about this and it's a real credit to Les and his group and, and really everybody in its entirety is that we don't have any major glaring holes, um, you know, where it's like, okay, you've got to address this position or else, you, you know, we're not really asking anybody to feel like they have to come in and immediately start. You are trying to provide depth at some positions there's different things based on the personnel groupings offensively or defensively that we want to try to fulfill. There's some different things that Joe D. Camillus and Dwayne Stukes are looking for to help kind of fill out the way that we env envision trying to be one of the upper echelon special teams uh, units and outfits in the league. But um, that's something that if, if it happens, it, do, it happens, but, but we feel more than comfortable if we don't draft the center uh, that we can fulfill that with the guys that we already have on the roster right now. Sean, you mentioned special teams. Uh, are you comfortable with the symbol there right now, or do you feel like you need to get a returner uh, in the draft? It's a good question. I think Simba did some, some really nice things. Um, obviously, adding Deshaun Jackson, he's had some experience in history returning punts, but uh, I don't think you can find enough guys that, that have the ability to, to influence and affect the game when the ball's in their hands, and certainly those returners and Hopefully, if, if we continue to be as successful as we were and as we've been over the last handful of years defensively, that punt return uh, unit and operation is extremely important. And, uh, you know, we've got guys that, that are capable, but, but if there is somebody that, that provides return value, that certainly makes them more enticing. You know, when you look at some of these receivers or guys on the back end that, that can also provide, um, you know, real punt return and kick return value for Coach D. Camillus and Coach Stukes, it's definitely something that, that we take into consideration as well. Tom, what do you value more in that position? Just getting your offense on the field and him catching it or a guy that can, can take it to the house? Well, I think both are, are really important. You know, uh, Coach D. Camillus, uh, you know, you're looking for guys that can score points. But uh, I think, you know, it, it's all of those things. It's, it's ball security, it's decision making, and then it's ability to be able to create Get, hit those vertical seams, make people miss and, and get vertical. But the guys that can ring the bell, as Joe D. Camillus would say, are, are certainly the ones that are the most enticing and the guys that you want. But hard to find them. They're rare guys. But but I think, you know, you've got to be able to, number one is, is the ball security and the decision making. And then uh, the explosiveness and the ability to create after that is, uh, you know, are the things that you'd love to be able to have. But there's very few that can actually check all those boxes. We get a couple more guys. Les, how would you uh, assess this year's draft class of inside linebackers? Uh, I'll keep my true assessment in house. <laughs> 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 so uh, I, you know, I, I, I hear there's, you know, there's maybe first round, right? Uh, but uh, it's, you know what, it, I'll, the, the one thing I will say is with with the inside linebackers, it's it's interesting. Uh, the interesting part of evaluating inside linebackers how the game's changing, seeing who's playing and how how college football, how college defenses are utilized. Uh, player, like you can you can watch uh, again the kid that ran yesterday at LSU go out transfer from North Dakota State and and go cover you know the number three receiver you know, then in the slot similar to what nickel. Uh, corners do so it, it's fun it's in this assessment of trying to work through uh, what types do we have what types do we need uh, who can help you know also uh, cover kicks and those type things so uh, that's a very important position to scrutinize on you uh, you mentioned not having major glaring holes to fill is this draft unique or different for you in that way have you seen have you had that before My, you know, it's 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 a it's a uh, enticing 
spot to be in because you can uh, truly uh, let the draft unfold. And, and I call it right quotes, take the best available player because best available player can be subjective. Our best available, you know, maybe, you know, another team's not best available. So that's subjective. But what it does it do is it gives you a little bit of freedom. This year, we were probably uh, at this point in time, I don't know if we let it out in a press conference, but we're pretty intentional about uh, attacking that running back spot. Uh, maybe this year a little bit different, so it gives you that flexibility. But, you know, that's that's the nice thing about uh, where we're at and uh, as a football team. Hey, Sean, how do you evaluate a player that opted out last season coming into the draft? Are you gonna lean more on like intangibles and you see that as a coach, you can put some of those intangibles on the field? Yeah, I think, um... You know, Les and his group do such a great job with the background. The, the tape is always the best guiding light. And, you know, so you go back to their 19 film and, and you use that as the most important reference. And then the character is all a big part of it. And Les and his group do an outstanding job of, of vetting these players and really the, our coaches as well. But, you know, it's all part of it. But the most important thing that guides our decision making is, is first and foremost, you know, the tape. And, uh, you don't punish a guy this past year has certainly been, uh, you know, I think one that uh, is, is, is different in so many ways, but you don't punish guys for that. You go back to the tape, uh, you look at what they've previously done. And then there are some projections with guys that maybe have less uh, tangible evidence on the tape and, and, and it all is a part of the evaluation process, but, but certainly nothing weighs more than, than when you're evaluating them playing the game that we're going to ask them to do. You know what, uh, I'll add to that. One of the uh, bigger impacts of COVID is, and, and Sean picked up on the cue, right, is when we're watching a player and you start with film when uh, the stands are full, Sean did go, okay, this is an opt-out, right? Because, you know, you watch 19 tapes. So that's probably one of the, the major impacts of COVID and the opt-out is, hey, this must be an opt-out because stands are full. Right. Did Cliff call you guys and let him know that he was upset about last year's draft and you guys wanted to up, you know, up the ante? No, you know what? I, I well, a couple things. You know, I was glad Cliff was such a big fan watching us on Hard Knocks to know every detail about what went on. And then, uh, you know, I think he was trying to get me back for when I got him a couple years ago before he had coached the game with the Cardinals and. Uh, he had gone out to dinner with a, with a group of people and Mahomes was there and I had him convinced that he was going to miss out on that first overall pick and he and Steve Kime weren't going to be able to draft Kyler Murray. So I think that was a delayed payback that he was trying to get me on, but I'm glad that he's watching, uh, was watching our hard knock season so closely. <laughs> yeah, it does seem like we've seen Pete Carroll without his shirt on, Sean without his. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Coach Shanahan to, you know. <laughs> The uh, three, three more guys. Les, with uh, Jalen, you know, kind of on a long-term deal, but Darius only on the one-year tender, um, how important might cornerbacks be for you guys in, in terms of this draft? Sean and Les, please. Uh, yeah, it would be, uh, you know, it's always important to add corner depth. And I do think like, like we have over the, the last few years, we've been able to draft, uh, have that player not come in and have to, right, cover teams, you know, number ones or number two wide receivers immediately. But again, like I, uh, where we're at in the draft, 57, and then, and then 88, 103, really at that point in time, you, you don't want to go into it going, hey, we have to have this position. That's where you may reach. So, uh, but we're well aware of, right, uh, of the corners and, whether play inside or out, both just outside, whether, you know, whether uh, Joe D and Coates uh, likes what they've done covering kicks in college. And, and like you mentioned before, whether they've returned some or kicks in their time. So uh, uh, we're definitely well aware, but uh, that's a position that's sought after. And uh, a, lot of, a lot of good players usually go early in that position because it does take a special, uh, special, special human uh, to be able to go do that, uh, play that position for sure. That's it.
<laughs> hey, Les, Les, I just wanted to follow up on that too. Um, obviously, the cap was what it was this year, but as you guys start to learn more about what it might do next year, is there is somebody who you'd like to begin talks with about something long term um, to keep them in your in your facility, or or at what point do those decisions start to get talked about? I think it's obvious there is is someone you'd love to be around for a long time. The, the, we'll definitely begin having those discussions both internally. Uh, we're a little bit tougher right now based on the the variable you mentioned and, and even tougher for planning because you're not necessarily sure uh, how next year goes and what's going to happen there. But, uh, you know, it, it, as Wade Phillips, you said, uh, you know, good players get paid and Darius has proved to be a good player. So, yeah, uh, and I always say, yeah, we'd love to have as many good players as possible. Guys like Darius, Nicole, his story, give him credit, give our coaches credit for, you know, developing him and give, you know, having the courage to put him out there and give him credit for making the most of that opportunity. Wrap up with Stu. Hey, Les and Sean, you guys have been asked in a couple of different ways just about the impact of COVID on the evaluation process this year between the opt outs and kind of the limited medical evaluation process. So there seems to be, at least my perception, maybe others, a more increased risk as far as taking chances on guys with one or the other compared to previous years. How do you assess that risk? And then based on the way you've gathered information, how comfortable does that make you, or less comfortable perhaps, taking chances on guys who either fall into that category of opt out or maybe have a medical history? If I answered, I, I think uh, Reggie Scott, his staff, our doctors, they may have more gray hair than I do. What I can tell you is the information Reggie has provided myself, I, I'm not as, I don't have as many gray hairs, and I think it's a credit for, to them for being able to, to orchestrate this, uh, you know, with all the, the adversity, if you want to call it that, that they uh, ran in. So, uh, but the information they've provided is, is as good as it has been in the past and, and maybe uh, and maybe even better at times with, with, with some people who didn't get to Indy per se because it's been such a proactive uh, intentional, intentional process. But, uh, you know, it, medical's a thing, right? You're gonna be playing uh, football for a long time, high school, college, uh, you know, the, them has started a lot of games. Uh, some have been injured previously. Things, things like that. It's a, you know, it's a hazardous occupation. But uh, you know, there's, you know, that's the the probabilities are are very, I mean, very similar to what they've been in the past. Reggie, everyone who's been behind the scene, that's not just on our staff, to make this happen uh, and, and get the information to us. Last one, guys. Hey, I just wanted to get your guys. Uh, I don't think we've spoken to you since uh, Aaron Donald kind of went through uh, an interesting week and just kind of wanted to get your perspective on how that turned out and going forward with, if anything, what that means. Yeah, I think, uh, I think uh, Gary, Kevin Demoff, when he was asked about it, said it best. I think it's why you let things play themselves out. Um, we had spoken to Aaron. I had spoken to Aaron immediately. And, uh, you know, I have total trust in him. And, and we were very confident that the facts would come out and that this would be something that would kind of take care of itself as you, uh, you know, just demonstrated patience and, and, and truly let the process play out. And, and that's exactly what it entailed. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's kind of where we were at with it and, and feel very fortunate. And, you know, Aaron was great, communicated very clearly and, and, um, uh, I you know, love Aaron and, um, you know, glad it worked itself out. All right. Thank you, guys. Hey, hey Artis, before we leave, let's, how's the draft house? It's, it's nice. <laughs> it's nice. People like it, Les. Yeah, Artis hadn't told you that's going to be where you y'all hang out. <laughs> Shouldn't one of you guys ask Mr. Cronkey to buy this for the media house, the front office media house? That's a... That's better than those tents artists put you in this fall. There you go. <laughs>